Welcome to Athens Politics Nerd. This week, I sit down with Patty Durand, a candidate for public service commissioner. She's running in the Democratic primary, but currently doesn't have any opposition. She'll face off against Tim Eccles, the Republican incumbent, in November. As the primary and local election in May gets closer, I'll probably be focusing more and more on interviewing candidates on this show rather than following what the mayor and commission is up to like normal. But I'll keep writing local news articles, which you can find on AthensPoliticsNerd.com and occasionally in the flagpole. Okay, let's get to it. Here's my interview with Patty Durand. Hi, Patty. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, So first, tell us a little bit about yourself, about why you're running for public service commissioner and about what a public service commissioner even does, because I think a lot of people probably don't know. Most people don't know, actually. And that's by design. Um, The Public Service Commission really should be called Public Utility Commission, and then people would know immediately what it does. But when you call it service, nobody really knows what that means. I'm running because I have a 12-year background in energy, and I ran a nonprofit called the Smart Energy Consumer Collaborative for 12 years, and that nonprofit was national in focus And we published research around consumers and energy. And we also educated consumers around energy. So we had a lot of educational work that we did with a website called smartgrid.org and the whole spectrum of reaching consumers to educate them about the transition that the electric grid is undergoing to a modern era, a modern clean energy era. So anyway, I ran that nonprofit. Before that, I worked at Georgia Tech for a year on grid modernization projects. And then before that, I ran the Sierra Club for Georgia. And I'm running because the Georgia Public Service Commission is regulated by five conservatives. And there's nothing wrong with being conservative. But there is something wrong when other viewpoints are not represented on the commission. That commission also, those five commissioners have no background in edu- or education in energy, no work experience. They really should not be serving the people of Georgia because you can see from their votes and their policies that they have not served Georgia well. And we can get into that in a minute, but that's why I'm running because there needs to be new, fresh voices on the commission and people with experience in energy. In your platform, you put a strong focus on lowering energy bills for consumers. Are our energy bills here higher than in other states? And yes, um, they how are. Would you, okay. And, and how would you accomplish lowering them? So Georgia pays, people living in Georgia pay the fourth highest energy bills in the country, which is crazy. Georgia Power likes to say that um, our rates are below the national average. And they are a little bit below the national average, but that belies the truth. The fact is people don't pay rates, they pay bills. And our bills are saddled with riders or extra charges on them that raise the price that people pay to power their homes. And also we, the state of Georgia is lacking a lot of programs and incentives that other states offer their people, other utilities offer their customers, that allows them to save money or to meet their values in any number of ways, whether it's clean energy or cool technologies or things like that. We pay so much more for energy than we need to. There's so much waste in this state that I discovered when I worked at my last um, job because I had a front row seat on what was happening across the United States and other commissions and other utilities. And there's some great, exciting, jazzy things happening. And then I'd come back here and be disappointed that those things weren't happening here. So among the things I would do would be to bring those programs here. For example, this is just one of probably 15 examples that I could give, but the one I'll give is from a utility in the DC area and the Maryland area. They have what's known as peak time rebates or summer rebate programs where a person can sign up to reduce their energy use during hot summer afternoons, which has a lot of expense to the utility that they just pass along to us in Georgia. But in those states, they allow customers to sign up for programs so that if they don't use energy at certain times of the day in the summer, they would get a rebate on their bill. 
So you can save money if you want to or need to. You can reduce waste if you care about sustainability. If you like technology, you can automate it and sign up. But in Georgia, we don't have anything like that. That's just one small example of many, many ways that we could be saving money. And didn't the Public <laughs> Service Commission just vote to, to raise our power bills just like a couple of years ago? They did in 2019. Georgia Power approached the commission with a $2 billion rate increase request, which is stunning. $2 billion is a very large rate increase. It was the largest in the country looking back or looking forward for five years. That's how big it was. And Georgia Power got, I guess, about 90% of their request. That 2019 was followed by a natural gas surcharge that's been added to our bills in 2022. And it was um, also additional costs for Plant Vogel added to our, our bills, which is the nuclear plant um, under construction in Waynesville, Georgia, not yet producing energy, but already hitting our bills. And I won't keep going, but there are many more. Yeah, I definitely want to ask you about that nuclear plant. Um, but first, let's talk about coal ash. So um, a recent uh, ProPublica investigation found that Georgia Power has known for decades that the way it's disposed of its coal ash was dangerous to the surrounding communities. Uh, so coal ash is, a, is toxic waste that's uh, left over when coal is burned. Um, but right now they're keeping it um, in unlined pits uh, and some of the radioactivity and heavy metals um, have been leaching out into the groundwater. And so like cancer rates in communities like Juliet, Georgia have been skyrocketing. But Georgia Power has actually been lobbying to change the definition of, of certain words like infiltration as a way to get around having to clean up their own waste. Um, and some regulators in Georgia have gone along with that. Um, so I was wondering, is there anything that the Public Service Commission can do about this? And how do we make them clean up their waste? The reason that there is a Georgia Public Service Commission is to address issues like this. Energy is complicated and regulating a monopoly utility requires a whole set of expertise that differs from a competitive market. And the reason that the PSC exists is to manage complexity. And that is one example of how we're harmed by the fact that our commissioners don't have energy expertise. So yes, the commission has everything to do. There are other state agencies that could also address it, like, like EPD, the Environmental Protection Division. But um, so, could George, so could the Georgia Public Service Commission. They are the ones that decide how much Georgia Power must pay to clean up their coal ash pits or, and, or whether they need to. Of course, everyone is watching the federal government because EPA, the Environmental Protection Administration, is ruling or has a signal they're going to rule that coal ash pits must be lined. And then if that passes, then this, all the states must require their utilities to do it. But for now, it's decided at the state level. And most states do require their coal ash ponds. To, but Georgia Power has unmitigated influence over the commission. And so the commission has not required them to line their, their pits. And then we see what we see with Juliet and many other communities in Georgia. And it's really a tragedy because people's lives are at stake and we're putting profits over people. And that's wrong. That's really wrong. Yeah, I, it, it is a tragedy. I just can't help but mention that, you know, yeah, I, I wish the work could get out a little bit more about stuff like this, because I think a lot of these people in these communities uh, who are suffering, um, they, they tend to vote Republican. Um, I know. Yeah. And as, as much as I don't don't like a lot of Trump's policies, he did say one thing that I agree with, and that is that social media is a way to reach people directly. You don't have to go through uh, a press office or a traditional media or buy expensive ads. So I do plan to use social media to great effect to try to reach a lot of people who might not otherwise know um, once my campaign gets going in earnest. So um, on your website, uh, you called the nuclear plant that's under construction right now, Plant Vogel, um, you called it Georgia's shame. Uh, why do you feel that way? It is shameful that this state is building the most expensive power plant ever built on earth. And let me just ask you, um, Chris, and maybe your listeners, have you ever heard of the CERN Hadron Particle Collider, which yeah. is the most 
You have. Okay. So for those of you that haven't, it is the most expensive scientific experiment ever created in the history of modern, the modern era. And it was going to be in Texas and it was going to be led by American scientists. It, its intention was to smash atoms into particles to help identify how the universe began. But Congress did not want to pay the $10 billion that project required. So it didn't happen here in the US. It went to Europe. That was $10 billion. That was too much for Congress to fund for the most expensive scientific experiment ever built on Earth. Now here we are in Georgia, one state building one power plant that's $30 billion. That should help you grasp how crazy expensive this plant is for a relatively small amount of energy of only 2,200 megawatts. That's not even that much. And studies show, and showed at the time it was approved, that the energy, that amount of energy could be met with um, a fourth of the cost using other sources, non-nuclear. But the commission approved it anyway in 2009. And then in 2017, well, let me see, maybe it was 16. The design for the nuclear reactor was so flawed that the construction agency building it went bankrupt because it was so expensive. It was way more expensive than they projected it would be. And so that triggered a renewal of commitment to the plant. So in 2017, the Georgia Public Service Commission looked at all the factors, all the costs, the bankruptcy, all of it, and decided to proceed despite all evidence that it was so much cheaper to build renewables. You could build four solar plus expensive battery storage plants for the same price as this power plant. And there's a little jokey saying that is, um, what do you get if there's a solar energy spill? You have a sunny day. <laughs> if you have a nuclear energy spill, it's a disaster. People die or get cancer and the area can't be lived in for a hundred years. But if it's a solar energy spill, there's literally no risk. It's just a sunny day. So we have all this risk and all this expense. And that's why it's Georgia's shame, because Georgia is not even a rich state. We're not heavily populated. There's no other state in the nation building nuclear. Is it because our Georgia Public Service Commission is so smart and just really know this great thing to do? No, it's because they're beholden to Georgia power and it's shameful. Um, I, I know that most Georgia Repub a lot of Georgia Republicans don't even believe in climate change, but trying to play devil's advocate here for a second. So nuclear energy doesn't produce any CO2 emissions. So maybe, you know, going forward, nuclear will be an important component of you our know, I, I, it, it can't be. It takes too long to build. This plant has been under construction since 2009. It's 2022. We've got to have emissions reduced by 2035 to not face the worst of climate change. We're already facing some of it. There's nobody that denies that they're seeing the effects of climate change now, but how bad is it gonna be is the question. And there's no need for nuclear. We could also have emissions-free power for renewable plus storage. All those technologies have advanced so much in the last 10 years. The prices continue to drop and it's so cheap now. That's why no other state is building nuclear, because renewable energy is more than competitive. It's, um, it's inexpensive. And yes, yeah, storage is still a bit expensive, but those prices are coming down a lot every year, just like all new technologies do. So is solar. But whereas nuclear is not coming down, it is stunningly expensive. And this plant at $30 billion, let's just be clear, it's not been delivered yet. It's not operating yet. And it was supposed to be operating in March of this year. Now it's been delayed to September. And the last filing is now saying February of 2023. This is crazy. This is absurd. I mean, I don't even know what to say. The idea that nuclear is going to solve climate change is false. It can't. It's too expensive and it's too slow. Not, and that just ignores all the danger of leaking tritium into the waterways and a nuclear spill or an earthquake in Georgia or any number of things that could happen to make this plant risky to the people living in Georgia. It doesn't need to be this way. 
are we just really bad at building nuclear plants? Like, why is this taking so long and been so expensive? Yeah. I don't even understand it. Well, yeah, so it had streamlined permitting. Some people like to blame the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the state of Georgia. It had streamlined permitting. If you were to look at the permit request and the approvals, they were stunningly fast. And I've got the data. I can show it to you or anybody that wants to see it. The problem is that the reactor designs are flawed because they're not often built. So they're few and far between. So they're being designed. It's new design, untested, untried. And, you know, people want to do the right thing. I don't think there's malice behind this. I think Westinghouse really wanted to and thought they had solid designs with the AP1000 reactor units. South Carolina bought in, Georgia bought in, other states bought in. They didn't start, though, but their, fl- their designs were flawed and, and it didn't work. And they went bankrupt. South Carolina pulled out. They saw the expense and the flawed design and said, oh, we're out. We can't, we can't do this. But, and, then, and then now we have um, a level of incompetence at Southern Nuclear, a Georgia Power's subcontractor, for the plant Vogel reactors that that I did not know about. I don't think anybody knew about until recent filings by the plant Vogel independent monitor, a man named Don Grace. And if someone wants to see these filings, they can go on the Public Service Commission website and I can send it to you, but you can read Don Grace's filings. He's a professional engineer, a nuclear expert, and he has outlined in his filings stunning incompetence from Georgia Power employees and management on the testing, on the building of the reactor, on the decision making they've made, that is very disconcerting. And I I don't know how to explain. Again, maybe it's just lack of experience. Building nuclear is not something that happens very often. And then you bring in people to do it for the first time. But I do know a little bit about systems testing, and I know that the systems testing that I've seen in Don Grace's report that Don calls out as incompetent is is a violation of engineering standards that can't be explained from lack of experience. Don Grace's report indicates he thinks it might be the rush that they're under to try to meet all of these missed deadlines. And as they try to meet deadlines, they skip important steps in the hopes of meeting those deadlines. And those steps are important and can't be skipped. And that leads to failures. And that leads to incompetence. And that leads to delays. Um, So um, is there anything else on your platform that you'd like to highlight? Um, Like, what else does the Public Service Commission do? Electricity is the most important thing. And we haven't talked very much about renewable energy or grid modernization. The other areas, though, just to answer your question, includes natural gas. Georgia has a deregulated natural gas market. So that's why everyone gets to pick their natural gas providers. Georgia PSC regulates all of the natural gas market with a light hand because it's deregulated. And as a result of the rules set by the commission, our natural gas bills are 50% higher than the national average. So that is one area that I would take a look at and fix. As you may have noticed, everyone's monthly natural gas bill has a very high flat fee. Even in the summer, when you do nothing with natural gas, except maybe use your stovetop a little bit, you're still paying $40, which is ridiculous. And then uh, the commission also regulates telecom somewhat. I mean, telecom is another free market area There's no universal access law, so businesses that don't find it profitable to go to rural rural Georgia where their population density is very low and homes are far apart, they just don't go there. And so those people don't get that service, which is now really critical for the era we live in. We learned during the pandemic, you've got to have an internet because you can't go to the doctor online. You can't log in for school lessons. You can't attend Zoom meetings like the one we're on. You can't do anything online. And that's a requirement now for 2022 in this era. And then um, there's also some facilities that they regulate. There's a lot of smaller, less public areas of importance that they regulate. But for my purposes for the campaign, the big ones are electricity, 
and natural gas, and the other ones are important. So they'll still get my attention, but they won't be the main focus. Okay. Well, would you like to give us your closing statement? Um, sure. Why should uh, people vote for you over your opponent? And I guess I'm talking about your Republican opponent because you don't have a Democratic. Opponent. That's correct. Uh, yep. So my Republican opponent has finished 12 years in office and his record is a disaster for Georgia. Our bills are very high. Our renewable energy rate is under 10 percent and half of that is biomass. So if you consider burning wood waste in 24-7 incinerator sustainable, then I guess you can count that, but I don't. So if you take that out, then it's under 5%, while our neighbors in North Carolina have renewables in excess of 20% of their generation mix. I would bring, my values include a, a transition to a clean energy future that many, many states are undergoing, including our peers in North Carolina and South Carolina and Texas and um, Maryland, but are not happening here. And then my other values include treating people respectfully because this commission does not do that. So examples include bill pay assistance is in the rock bottom. So people struggling with energy poverty have almost no help. They basically just get their lights turned off and then I would provide a lot more assistance relative to peer states, which I'll do a better job. And then my position at the Smart Energy Consumer Collaborative really gave me a front row seat into what other states are doing. And I would bring that grid modernization knowledge and experience here to Georgia so that when we are talking about the future, building a big thing and making people pay for it isn't going to be what we do. We're going to have policies. We're going to have distributed energy like rooftop solar. We're going to allow people to meet their values around energy, whether that's saving money through new programs or reducing expensive building projects, or whether it's may enabling new technologies that this, that this state does not require Georgia Power to offer, like peak time rebates, demand response, and access to your own energy data on a much more granular level than is allowed now. And there's a whole host of programs and, and um, ways to save money that does not happen here that I, I won't bore your, your listeners with, but because it, it's really the job of regulators to know those programs, which I do know. Um, and that's what voters would hire me to do, would be to bring those programs to Georgia, save everyone money, clean up the air and clean up our energy mix, and allow people to be as active with energy as they want to be in this era that we live in where people can be active now, or if they just wanna pay a fair bill, that's fine too. So that's what I would do for, the, for Georgia if I'm elected. Great, well, um, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I know we covered some complex topics in this one, but when you step into the voting booth, it gets a lot simpler. The Republican incumbent voted to raise your power bills. Patty Durand wants to lower your bills. It's so frustrating to me that issues like this don't normally seem to matter in down-ballot elections. It's all about who you identify with, the blue tribe or the red tribe. Because if it was about the issues, how would Patty not get 99% of the vote? And even then, who are the 1% voting for higher power bills? Maybe they're Georgia power executives, I don't know. Anyway, lower power bills are on the ballot in this election. Just saying. Thanks to everyone who donates to keep this show running. And I'll see you on the next one.